Thank you. So I'm uh, going to talk briefly about a research project that I'm undertaking with colleagues Jake Hacker and Nick Hopper. Nick is here today. Uh, he's technical director for Monodraft Limited. Um, and the research project is the application of inorganic phase change material thermal stores in sustainable building design in Europe. Um, conveniently enough, Nick is an expert on phase change material thermal stores, so it's a useful person to have on the team. Um, so the project, uh, we, we were fortunate enough to secure a, an institute for... Is it possible to turn this down a little bit? It's very loud, actually. Uh, the, the project, uh, we were fortunate enough to secure an institute of sustainable resources um, building product research grant, which is going to help us to take the project forward. Uh, we commenced it early in the year, and it's still got a year to run. So we've, uh, we've started to make progress. We haven't got to the quantitative bit of the project yet, but we've got some uh, first steps to report. So... Um, the project's going to focus on looking at the applicability of uh, phase change material thermal stores in Europe, looking at evaluating the viability of uh, and identifying environmental benefits and any potential disbenefits of using this technology. Um, the interesting thing about, uh, in relation to this project, what we're focusing on is potential for thermal, uh, phase change material thermal stores to, uh, to provide significant energy savings by delivering highly controllable passive summertime cooling and displacing some active... Uh, cooling use. Um, and they, they also uh, have the potential to uh, temper incoming air in winter, which can help to reduce energy use through uh, reducing the heating set point. The project focuses on in inorganic phase change material, phase change materials, which aren't commonly used in buildings at the moment. Most of the phase change materials you'll find are organic. So let's move on. So what are phase change materials? Well, um, all materials are phase change materials. Um, they change phases depending on uh, temperature and pressure. Um, one of the, you know, the reasons why uh, ice cubes in a gin and tonic, um, one of the reasons why they keep it so cool is because, uh, because they're a phase change material. Latent heat diffusion, uh, when the ice cubes melt, helps keep the, the uh, gin and tonic cool. And um, it's also one of the reasons why the cubes are slow to melt. Um, when we're talking about, our focus on this project is on phase change materials that can help to keep building interiors comfortably cool in summer. These change, phase change materials uh, typically have a freezing, freezing and melting point of around 22 degrees centigrade. Uh, in, so we're focusing on inorganic phase change materials. Phase change materials are either organic or inorganic. The organic phase change materials, which are the ones fairly commonly used in, in uh, buildings at the moment, typically paraffin-based, relatively high cost, and also flammable, which is not particularly convenient in, in the building environment. So as a result, they typically end up being encapsulated uh, in things which aren't so flammable, such as plasterboard and different kinds of ceiling tiles. Um, we're focusing on inorganic phase change materials, which typically uh, sell hydrates, relatively low cost, and convenient enough they're, they're not flammable. They do typically require some form of thickening agent to stop them separating out, and, and that's often an organic phase change. That's often an organic product, so they're not a sort of totally straightforward product. Um, okay, moving on to say, what is a, what's a thermal store? So concept uh, is simply that they can store a particular thermal condition, get charged, store it for some uh, designated period of time, and then release it. And thermal stores can be used in a range of applications in, in buildings. Uh, you can, for example, store heat uh, from summer, store it, release it in winter to help uh, heat a building. Um, that's called interseasonal storage, and it's not very widely used at the moment, but it's, uh, uh, it's something which is being increasingly talked about now, which I think is very interesting. Um, the, the version we're looking at in this project is, is uh, using phase change material thermal stores to store cool th from, from the night in summertime, store it uh, in the morning, and then release it in the afternoon when, when things start getting a bit warm. So these diagrams below give a very simple indication of uh, how that operates. So they can be, they can, the thermal store can be charged at night when this is an external temperature indicative external temperature gradient for a 24 hour period. This is an indicative internal temperature gradient for a space, yeah, which is warmer. Um, so these stores are typically charged at night when it's cool outside, and then they simply store the cool 
uh, in the morning when things are relatively comfortable internally, not too hot. And then uh, when things would start getting uncomfortably hot in the afternoon, the, the store releases the cool, and that simply just chops the, chops the peak off of the internal temperature. So it's a kind of simple mechanism. Uh, the, the interesting thing about phase change material thermal stores, what interested me was the fact that they can store cool and then you can release that in a very targeted way, which, is, which has got some similarities to the way that active cooling systems work. Yeah? So thermal mass in buildings is used a lot in this country to help to uh, damp uh, diurnal temperature fluctuations, but it doesn't have that switchability that, that, that thermal stores do. Okay, so Monodraft has develop, already developed Cool Phase, which is a phase change material th store product which is available on the market. So Nick Hopper, the director, technical director, is going to talk about that briefly. So good afternoon. Um, yeah, my name is Nick Hopper. I'm the technical director for Monodraft. And um, Oliver's asked me to give you a, a bit of a talk about um, a commercial product that we launched in uh, 2011. Um, it's a ceiling mounted uh, phase change store. But it's uh, unlike the, uh, the project that we're working on, which is passive based, this is an, an active type system. So it has an air handling unit mounted in the center of the system, and the phase change material is mounted either side of it. And uh, we've configured the phase change material to be in like a heat exchanger configuration. So it's highly effective in, in able to charge and discharge the, uh, the, the energy store um, from nighttime through to daytime. So the unit itself is, is modular in nature and ceiling mounted, so it can basically be fitted in, in most applications. And uh, a duct connects it to the outside. So during the night, we, we bring in cool nighttime air, uh, we charge the phase change material, and then during the day, that, uh, that's then able to be discharged, providing uh, a cooling effect. Uh, during the day, we've got a, a very intelligent uh, method within the air handling system so that we're able to control whether the air is brought in from, uh, from outside, whether we mix it with recirculated air, and uh, whether we, we pass it over the phase change material at all. So, so during the, the start of the day, we'll just bring fresh air in, and then as the, as the temperatures build up during the day, we'll then switch to providing a cooled recirculated air, passing it over the, uh, the phase change material before we then start the process all again in the evenings. During a winter time, we're actually able to do a sort of heat harvesting effect. So uh, we'll actually start charging the phase change material up at about 3 o'clock. And uh, so sort of almost scooping the, uh, the waste heat that's been built up in the room um, throughout the day. And that's then used to temper fresh air um, the following day for, for during uh, winter use. Um, Part of the reason we're, we're so involved, we're, you know, we're so uh, excited about this type of technology is that um, you know, when you look at the, the, the global situation with air conditioning, um, some of the statistics that have, have come out about energy use for air conditioning are, are, are quite high. Um, you know, a rough estimate for the combined worldwide energy use of air conditioning is one trillion kilowatt hours of energy, and that's equal to the yearly energy use of Russia. Um, when you bear that in mind with, with the sort of uptake of what air conditioning can do um, and its associate, associated energy use, most of the world's developing cities are in, uh, are in the tropics. And in 2007, only 11% of households in Brazil had air conditioning. But if you compare that to the United States, 87% had air conditioning. Yet there's a greater area of temperate climate for the, uh, for the US. Thank you. OK, thank you. Fantastic. Right, so moving on. Okay, so moving back to the, moving back to the general from the specific, um, one of the things we're looking at, started looking at is applicability across Europe. So uh, where might uh, phase change material thermal stores uh, have, a, have a role in summertime cooling? So just looking at some data very quickly for London and then moving down to a hot, hotter area, Seville, up to a cooler area, Tromso. So, this graph shows uh, weather, typical, uh, average weather, uh, average temperatures over the year externally, average minimum, maximum, average maximum in London. And it also shows um, maximum and minimum comfort target temperatures according to uh, the uh, European Adaptive Comfort Standard. Um, and the, this data below is extracted from that. And what, it, what it shows is um, 
the uh, maximum comfort temperature minus the average low temperature. So what it shows is, uh, you know, how much cooler at night is the temperature than the maximum target you're aiming for in the day. Yeah? So that shows wherever there's, so cool in this, in this uh, instant is, is relative. Yeah? It's relative to your targets. Um, and what this shows is that typically in London, uh, at night, it's, it's nearly 15 degrees cooler than the maximum temperature you're aiming for internally in the day. Yeah? So it shows that there's a good, there's a good uh, amount of ambient cool in the air outside available at night. And if you could just grab a load of that, store it for the afternoon, you wouldn't have to use active, active cooling systems. Yeah? So um, daytime temperature, again, the internal max in London generally stays below the uh, maximum external temperature. So uh, London's, London's well suited. You know, in this kind of very generalized indication of whether it's uh, applicable, London's well suited because there's good access to cool and daytime conditions aren't too challenging. Um, moving down to Seville, it's a lot warmer. And what, what we find is um, you can see the comfort targets cross underneath the, the average maximum temperature for the summer period. Uh, if we move down to the graph below, Interestingly enough, what we can see, you know, th there's a good diurnal temperature swing uh, between day and night across the whole of Europe. Yeah? So although Seville is a very, very hot part of Europe, it, it has a good day and night uh, diurnal temperature difference. You've still got a 10 degree um, temperature difference between tip average nighttime temperatures and uh, the maximum comfort temperature you want to stay below in the daytime. So from that perspective, again, there's, there's good applica applicability in Seville for using... Uh, uh, these uh, th this thermal storage technology. If you, if you look in the um, if you look at the daytime temperatures, you can see that at external temperatures in the day typically go five uh, around about five degrees above uh, the maximum comfort temperature in, inside. So what that tells you is that there's good applicability, but you're going to potentially have to use an awful lot of uh, phase change materials to give you sufficient thermal capacity to keep the building cool in the daytime. So if you move if you, if you head way north uh, north of Norway, it's a lot cooler. Comfort targets are always above uh, the average external uh, temperature conditions. Um, and what you can see here is that you've got plenty of cools available at night in the summer. There's more than a 15 degree difference between uh, average lows and uh, the comfort max. Um, the, the only question here is, do you need to use this sort of technology at all? In the daytime, in summer, it's still 10 degrees cooler outside than the maximum temperature you're, you're aiming for. So typically, you shouldn't really need to use these sorts of technologies to keep a building cool. But that's, that's very generalized. In, in certain instances where you've got high heat gains in a building, or where, where you may be dealing with an existing building that's got overheating problems, then this sort of technology could be useful. So that's sort of a general look at that. Okay. So some of the design approaches we're going to be looking at in more detail on the project are um, simple application here. So these are just indicative. Um, these are just indicative graphs below that again just show uh, how the thermal store works. So this is a simple sort of product-based approach where a thermal store is incorporated into into an interior. It's charged at night. You get storage in the morning when things are quite comfortable, and in the afternoon when things hot up, it, that cool is discharged into the room. Which uh, so cool phase takes. Uh, takes a much more sophisticated approach, which is slightly along these lines, but does a lot more clever things too. Um, we also, the main focus is going to be on building integrated approach to phase change material thermal stores. So this application uh, is integrated into a buoyancy driven ventilation system where you get charging at night, which is stat driven charging, ventilative cooling of the fabric and thermal store cools. In the daytime, you can use uh, stat driven ventilation to help keep keep the room cool, and when it starts really hotting up in the afternoon, then you can switch to uh, benefit from downdraft, uh, passive downdraft cooling through the thermal store. Uh, other application we're going to be looking at in more detail is um, integration into a double facade system. So you get all sorts of double, double facades used in architecture these days, ranging from sophisticated double facades on uh, high-rise buildings, um, down to more basic cavity wall constructions, and they could all have some form of thermal store integrated within them. So here, thermal store is integrated within the facade, so it sheds heat at night, charges the store. That's stored in the daytime until it's needed, at which point ventilation into the room happens through the store and cools the room. So 
we started looking at more detail at specific uh, uh, applications and products. Here's a very simple example of a, of a store that's built into a window or curtain wall system which could potentially just be glazed, into, glazed in. Um, it gets charged at night via simple opening of a vent to the exterior, store the coolant until it's needed, and then in the daytime, the vents into the interior just helps to discharge that cool. So, so we sort of um, made a start on the project. Next steps are going to be to look in more detail at the performance potential of these different options by modeling a, a case study building using dynamic thermal modeling to ascertain some of the thermal and energy saving benefits. Um, so thermal compared to uh, no active cooling and energy saving compared to using an active cooling system. And with a part of Monodraft, um, we're going to be constructing and testing a physical prototype of one of the products that we're developing at this stage. Uh, that will then be installed in a live building, so we'll get some data out from that too. So, thank you. That's all for now. Thanks. Question, time for a couple of questions. One question here. You briefly mentioned uh, summer storage for winter use. Yes, yeah. But then you didn't go into detail. Is there anything realistic happening in that context? Um, no, I think. Um, I'm not aware of phase change materials being used for, um, for uh, interseasonal storage. Uh, maybe the, the scale of storage you need means it wouldn't be a good option. The uh, examples I'm aware of have been historical examples uh, of water used to store heat from a summer solar thermal array, uh, which, is there, which then preheats air in coming in winter. Um, I'm involved in a separate uh, research project that's looking specifically at interseasonal architecture. Because I think the concept is a very interesting one. Well, if you think that, it, that given the weather conditions we've got in, in Europe, really through the year there's, we've got plenty of access to the right kind of thermal conditions that, we, that we're aiming for in, internally um, you know, in summer and winter. And if we could, we could just grab some of that uh, summer condition, uh, take it from the summer, give it to the winter so we don't have to use fossil fuels to heat. If we can do the reverse in summer or just use nighttime cool in summer, then it's a very simple and elegant idea. But how that would translate into an architecture is an interesting thing, which is something else I'm looking at. Yeah. So, thanks. Any other questions? Question here. Hi. Um, I work with greenhouses a lot, and they're obviously a very good uh, mm. sort of you know, way of capturing heat. Yeah. Um, obviously, it's also a site of overheating. So it's kind of, it, you know, it would be good to sort of interface with a technology that, that, like yeah. that, that could release it when and where needed. Yeah. Um, have you started to look at that? No, not, not in relation to greenhouses. Uh, I think um, there might be a similar issue with the interseasonal thermal storage um, in that I think the scale of, of heat you'd have to take away in greenhouses uh, w would imply you'd need to d use uh, phase change materials on a large scale. And the examples that I've seen are more like the, the Alpine House in Kew Gardens designed by Wilkinson Air with Atelier 10 that uses a, a um, thermal labyrinth underneath the building to give some, some serious thermal mass and, and uses, pu pushes air through uh, at night uh, to, to cool it and then in the daytime it brings cool air in. So I, I, I guess the que a question is, uh, you know, at what point would you want to use phase change material thermal, thermal store? And, and at, at what scale of storage would you want to switch across to some other form of thermal capacity which relates more to thermal mass in, in buildings or to the use of thermal labyrinths, um, which can give you a, a very high level of thermal capacity. So something that we'll be looking at in this project that we haven't looked at yet is just to get a, a, bit, of, a bit more of an idea of how readily available, cheap and benign these inorganic phase change materials are, because you hear that they're, they are cheap, readily available, and benign, but uh, sometimes it's quite difficult to get to the bottom of it, because quite a lot of the, the mixes that are available on the market, um, the suppliers won't disclose w yeah, what they actually consist of, of, and you could, you could... A lot of the processes are, are quite hidden away, the, the chemical compositions of the phase change material. It, you know, it is like a Coca-Cola recipe. No, no one discloses what exactly is in these things. So it, it's, uh, there's a lot of um, uh, competitiveness in the industry. Yeah. But there has been some work done on, on greenhouses and phase change materials in, in maintaining um, uh, temperatures uh, overnight.
Uh, just a quick question. Uh, have you ever thought of using it within the floor? I mean, certainly, that's, that's, certainly that's one of the one of the aspects. The interface that, working quite well. One of the aspects with call phase is that we've we have looked at um, having a floor mounted system, and it's something that's on on the development cards at the moment. Okay, thank you very much. I mean, I think with the urban heat island and with climate change, this can only increase as a as a topic of importance. Thank you very much. Thank you.